The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Well, if you've been here the last few weeks and tracking with us, we are in a study, a uh, three or four week study that is loosely, actually very loosely, based on this book. It didn't see it coming by Kerry Newhoff. He looks at seven of things that... Uh, that no one expects to happen in our lives, but things that creep up on all of us. They may not creep up on all of us today, but over the course of our life, some of these things build, some of these things come and go and disappear, but they're all things that none of us are interested in, but, but capture all of us. We looked at cynicism, and we looked at emptiness. Today, we're going to look at irrelevance. And in the next few weeks, I uh, don't know which ones yet I'm going to actually land on, but pride is another one. Burnout is another one. Apathy is another one. And these are all things that sneak up on us. And it's surprising how they all kind of fit together. And as the passage that uh, Andy read for us, I think, and, I, and maybe you're in this place today, where you feel like all I am is, is a pile of dry bones in the wilderness. Folks, God wants to breathe new life into us. And if we are sitting here and we have acknowledged over the last few weeks that cynicism, that's me, or emptiness, that's me, or today, irrelevance, that's me, then I believe God wants to breathe new life into us. So let's talk about irrelevance. Irrelevance? No. Irrelevance. I'll probably do that two or three times today. This is the, 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 the one who at one time in his life was on the cutting edge, uh, an influencer of people, sharp, the top dog, a valued voice in his community, and now it's just kind of left in the dust. This is the successful businessman years ago that, that now his, his ways and his principles just don't work anymore because the world has changed. You know, what was taught in business school 25 years ago is not taught in business school today because it's different. Some of you ever go out and buy the best refrigerator that money could buy? And if you did that 30 years ago or 40 years ago, it was probably olive green. <laughs> How many still have an olive green fridge or something like sitting on? You know what? The funny thing is, it's probably still wor working well. And they probably will last longer than the ones today. When I was in college, uh, I had an afro. 
I'm not showing you a picture. But I was really skinny, and I looked probably more like a Q-tip. I got rid of the afro, and uh, perfect timing in the early 80s, I had a mullet that, that was the best mullet of anybody. And like many people, I wore it way longer than I should have. I came to the place where when I got married, uh, and I realized that um, change was going to happen. <laughs> I was 37 years when, old when I got married, and I was really set in my ways. Folks, let me say the phrase, set in my ways, is never a good phrase. We default to it while well, I'm set in my ways. That, that, that just says I'm unwilling to change. If I'm set in my ways, when we got married, my set in my ways started to change. And some of it was very painful. First thing was my mustache was gone. Second, the mullet was gone. Third, some of my things started ending up in the garage and then in garage sales. And some of this was painful, but get this, and I'll come back to this in the end. Change, change always will happen if the pain related to change becomes less than the pain committed to standing at the status quo. So as a newlywed, we, you understand this, right? If I was going to maintain the way things were and set in my ways, the pain of keeping that was going to end up way worse for me than the pain of change. And it happens that way. It sneaks up on all of us. Nobody ever wants to become outdated. Nobody wants to become irrelevant. And as we've said the last few weeks, nobody ever sets out with the intention of becoming cynical. Nobody ever sets out with the hope uh, that when I accomplish everything, I'll end up empty. Nobody is drawing for that. Nobody ever thinks that they will ever be seen as irrelevant. Irrelevant, I did it again. If I just say it, I'm just going to keep going and you get it, right? Irrelevant. And... Um, uh, you know, you think, I, I used to be the computer expert in my family. But Jackson got to seven or eight years old, and... <laughs> it, it's funny, because Jackson very quickly took up on making movies and film, and this is what my master's degree is in. And, and it wasn't long. Jackson's probably 13 or 14 years old, and I'm working on a video on the computer, and Jackson's coming up going, here, Dad, I'll do that. Anybody understand? You get this? It happens to all of us. And all of a sudden, nobody's listening anymore. It's not just an old people problem. In a, in a very current culture world, a blogger could be the biggest blogger with the most followers today, and in a year from now, completely gone. Musicians come and go just as fast. The, the, the top movie director that everybody is watching and everybody is listening to and the biggest voice in Hollywood and everybody's going to the movies, it's only a matter of time before he's gone, completely gone and has no voice anymore. He could be here today on top of the world and all of a sudden, somebody else comes along with a new ideas and a new voice, and I'm left with no audience, with no influence, and I'm irrelevant. Most things don't really matter that much. But some things really do matter. Yeah, I, I, if, if it's styles, or if it's decoration, or the car I drive, it probably doesn't matter much, except maybe the way I think about myself or the way others think of me. But some things, when it comes to irrelevance, really, really matter. How does this affect my ability to communicate the truth of God? So if here I am, from 1992 with my mullet, right, and my big mustache, wearing my jacket, uh, Toronto Blue Jays 
vinyl Jaffa. And I'm walking around trying to tell people about Jesus. Folks, the truth is, and you know this as well as I do, that people will, will shut their ears simply because before you even open your mouth, they've written you off. Am I right? So the gospel never changes. The truth of Jesus never changes. The impact and the value never changes. But it seriously changes how we communicate it. And if we are irrelevant in our lives, it impacts the message of Jesus. So why are people no longer listening to me? I want to look at a couple of places in Scripture this morning. So if your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 11. And this is just an example. In this example, I'm going to say, for some of us who have been around church for a long time, this is going to be a stretch. But I want you to actually take the view of the religious leaders and the Pharisees. All right? Which we don't usually. Because we usually look at them as the antagonist and Jesus as the hero. In this culture, in this day, the, the, the religious leaders and the Pharisees were the heroes. They were the, the relevant voice leading in their, in, their, in, in their society and culture. And it was Jesus that came in as the antagonist. But listen to this. Mark 11, uh, in verse 11, Jesus came to Jerusalem, went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. And skip to verse 15. They came back to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered the temple and began to drive the people out, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but we have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of the religious law heard what Jesus has done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. So Jesus comes in and cleans house in the temple. And he's setting it right, providing a correction line. I want us to flip the perspective here. and Let's not take Jesus' perspective for a minute. Let's take the the, the, the religious leader's perspective, okay? So view yourself as one of them. And this guy comes in. Jesus comes in and starts turning everything in our culture, everything in our way, everything we've fought so hard to keep, everything I've spent my entire life building in honor of God. And all of a sudden... People are listening to Jesus' voice and not ours. My voice is becoming irrelevant in the culture that I built. Do you see that? And, and, and bit by bit, as Jesus does miracles and, and the crowds are following him, they see him as a pop culture leader, even though he was completely countercultural. And he had the influence of all the people. Now, now, he didn't come in and change anything. He came in and took their same history, their same stories, their same God. And, and, and as much as anything else, he provided a correction line. Because the generation after generation after generation, the follow of God, followers of God had, had slipped off in the wrong direction. And they were actually far more concerned with their methods and their ways than they were with the heart of the message. It was way more about the method than it was about the message. And Jesus comes along, and, and, and all of a sudden, one day, these religious leaders and the entire culture wakes up, and the leadership has no voice. They're irrelevant. And what do they do? They began to plan how to kill him. Ever feel like one of those religious leaders? You've worked hard to build this up. You've worked hard to be who we are, to have influence over people, to gain that, to earn that, to respect that, and you're relevant to your world or to your workplace. And then all of a sudden you wake up 
tomorrow morning and someone else has a greater voice and my voice is gone. There's two ways we deal with it as humans. We either fight it, we dig in, we talk about the way it should be, and we constantly look back to what it was. That's one way to deal with it. The other way to deal with it is to change. The hardest part of that is just admitting and giving it in. But you know, out of these religious leaders, only two or three of them ever changed. The rest continued to dig in. Now sometimes, change is just change, right? My mustache got shaved off. It really doesn't matter. But sometimes, change comes because God himself brings that change. And in this case, with the religious leaders, in this case, it was actually God bringing a correction line to the church, to his followers. I'm not so sure that we're really good at seeing the difference between change and culture change and God making changes or correction lines. The whole difference in irrelevance, it's, it's different from the 50-year-old olive green fridge, right? That's one thing. It still works fine, but obviously... If I'm going to buy a couch and we decide that we're going to spend the money on the best couch we possibly can because it's going to last, how do we look at that? Five years later, it's outdated. And is that going to sit in my living room? Some of you? Uh-uh. Right? We're replacing the couch. Others, 30 years later, the couch is fine. It's sitting in my living room. And the only people that laugh at it are my grandkids who come and see that my... Does that make sense? Some of that, like furniture, really isn't important. But when irrelevance is in my life, that's a whole other thing. Because irrelevance costs us. When it permeates into what I do, and how I communicate, and how I influence, and who I have influence on, this is then serious business. Irrelevance happens when language and methods and styles and ways no longer connect with the world around me and the people I love. Culture has moved on and nobody even had the courtesy to ask me. Flip over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we have the Apostle Paul. And he's uh, talking about what happened in Acts chapter 17 when he met Jesus. But in Acts chapter 3, uh, he's talking about to, to the church in Philippi, watch out for people who say it has to be this way. Right? Talking specifically about, uh, you know, 30 years before this, in order to be God's person, you had to be circumcised. No ifs, ands, or buts. In the book of Acts, as Gentiles, as non-Jews were becoming of faith, they decided circumcision isn't the big issue. Um, and he's going on about that here. And he says, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in what humans have done for us. And, and, and if it was about human confidence, I have more than anybody, Paul says. Look at verse 5. I was circumcised when I was eight day, days old. I was a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought things, these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Jesus has done. Yes, everything else is worth, worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ as my Lord. For this sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Jesus. 
Think about this for a second. All of these things, he says, that I have worked my entire life so hard to accomplish, all of them were driven from his passion for God. But all of these things I have worked so hard to accomplish, Jesus comes along and it's messed up from top to bottom in one day. He's at the pinnacle of his career, the verge of greatness. And in one day, Jesus takes it all away. And so Paul is in Damascus. He's in a room, probably sitting in the floor in agony over this, struggling over the surrender of this and getting his head wrapped around it. He wakes up the next morning. He can't see. Yay, this is awesome, right? No, pain is hard. And he says, I was working so hard to do what God wanted. That's what they told me. I was fighting for him. And then he had some dark days of struggle and of surrender and of humiliation and acknowledging the fact that he was off. All of what he did was just off. He counted all it lo as loss. My entire life's work, my education, my priorities, poof, poof, gone. So what if God ruined everything for you, everything, to bring you real joy? Would you do that? Would you be willing to do that? What, what, if, what if God ruined everything you've built and fought for your life saying you missed it? You chased the wrong things. Jesus prunes his people so that we are more faithful. But in the moment, nobody likes the pruning. Prune is pain, painful change. And so when Paul met Jesus in Acts chapter 9, he's at the top of the pack, the best of the best. He realizes now that everything he had worked so hard for was useless. How do we deal with that? How do you deal with that? There's only two options. I've said them before. We either fight it and dig in and hold desperately to what was, or we change, willingly or begrudgingly. So what does Paul say about that? That passage continues on. In the next paragraph here, Paul starts talking about, in verse 13, leave the past behind you. He says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forget what's in the past and look forward to what lies ahead. I'm going to press on to what God has for me now that I know what that really is. Even if it means my entire life up to this point was a waste. That's not easy change to make. That's not easy change to make. Yesterday is past. Tomorrow, God is knocking on the door. But what made Paul change? When he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, in the next days, there was pain. But we see over the, the continuing of his writing that even as he was so zealous in following God, the law which he was so desperately trying to keep, the ways of their religion, which he was fighting for, was not his passion. God was his passion. And so the moment he realized, face to face with Jesus, that he was actually fighting against God, what happened? Now, well, now the pain of change has become way less in his heart than the pain of status quo. And that's when we're willing to change. Here's an example. And I think if you drive, you probably understand this. Because all of us have a car sometimes where the tires are just about done. And if you're like me, I think, I think we can get the summer out of these. 
and I'll change them when we put the snow tires on, right? And we try to get as many miles out of these tires as we possibly can, and everything's good because it's the resisting the change and the cost and the work involved, and all of a sudden I'm driving one day and the weather's not really great, and a guy in front of me slams on his brakes or somebody walks out in front of me and I skid into the ditch. Guess what happens the first thing the next morning? I'm changing my tires. I'm at Boys Action Center and I'm getting new tires. Why? Because now the, the, the pain of status quo has now exceeded the pain of the new tires. I'm sure that you have all heard of a company called Kodak. Kodak was all about photography. Their mission was photography. Cameras and film and on and on and on. Photography. But at some point in their uh, progression of their business, they, they, they settled in on the niche in that business on film. And as digital photography was starting to take over, actually Kodak was the first company that developed a digital camera. But their digital camera was based on taking pictures digitally without film and then printing them, right? And they hunkered in on the film, even though they had a digital camera. They hunkered in on the film and the world changed. Things like Instagram shows up. And what happened with Kodak was they were no longer about photography they were about film. And film was simply a method of photography. The method became the mission and they're gone. You see that, right? Their methods became their mission and they were gone. They were no longer a photography business, they were a film business. Globe and Mail, a newspaper dealing with the same things. The decision is, are we in the newspaper business or are we in the news business? Because it's changing and if they're committed to the newspaper, it's only a matter of time before they're done too. Kodak's mission started right. The method became the mission and they lost it all. Their methods became irrelevant in the world and they're gone. So why is irrelevance a natural drift for all of us? The one sharp leader who is out of work at 50 and almost unemployment, unemployable. The, the filmmaker who was on top of the world 10 years ago, nobody watches their stuff anymore. The entrepreneur with several thriving businesses now peddles stuff just and getting blank stares. No one tells you why but you're just quietly dismissed as someone who doesn't get it anymore. Our willingness to constantly change gives us the ability to communicate the timeless truth of Jesus in a way that stays meaningful. If you want to influence people for Jesus, change is your friend. If I stubbornly hold on to my old ways and my old methods, then it's like trying to find film for your old camera. Look at the rest of Paul's life. As he traveled around and as he preached and as he started churches, uh, he adapted and he changed. He went into Ephesus. And in Ephesus, he stood right in the town square where all of the temples to these other gods were and very aggressively preached the truth of Jesus. He ended up in prison. He ended up thrown to the lions. But you know what, when he went to Corinth, and he went to Thessalonica, when he went to Athens, he changed. He goes to Athens, and you know the story, it's in Acts chapter 17. Uh, he's walking around in Athens before he talks to anybody, and there's, there's statues to gods everywhere, and he sees the statue to the god that says the unknown god. And he sits down, uh, he sits down with the philosophers, and he starts talking about this statue to the unknown God and their ears perk up. If he had done it the same as he did in Ephesus, he would have been in jail in, in Athens as well. 
Because at this point, Paul understood the, the mission. The mission is the solid truth, gospel, good news of Jesus, and it's unchanging. The methods always change. Every day, every situation. Charles Swindell said, irrelevance is a disgrace to the gospel. I think irrelevance in the church, when a church is irrelevant, it's a disgrace to the gospel. When our message is preached in ways that is not relevant, it's a disgrace to the gospel. When we are irrelevant, we're disgraced to the gospel. Anybody feel like you still have lots to contribute to the world, but nobody's listening? Here's what we need to do. My time is up. Let me go really quick. Here's what we need to do. It, whether it's cynicism or emptiness or irrelevance, we need a Kodak moment. We need that, that moment where we wake up and say our methods have become our mission, and we need to get back to the mission. We need to snap out of me and get with what God is doing. We need to jump in what God, to what God is doing today. Snap out of the past and see the future with hope and with beauty and with future. The mission of God is not anything to do with the style of music. The mission of God has nothing to do with the dress code. The mission of God is reaching a world for Jesus. It's going and making disciples. And that requires constant change because the world changes and we want people to listen. Let me skip ahead here. People who fail to understand change usually end up yearning for the past and we lose hope for the future. We lose hope for our brilliant mission and the foundation foundational message of truth falls on deaf ears. So let me ask, anybody here feel like the Pharisees? Where you've been holding down the fort and you've lost your audience? Nobody listens to you anymore? Maybe you identify with Paul who, who saw that and changed his method. Didn't change the message, changed his methods. So what does God have to say to this? What's God's dream for your future? What's God's dream for our future? That passage that Andy read before about the dry bones coming to life from Ezekiel. Folks, if we're cynics, if we're empty, if we're irrelevant, irrelevant, chances are that we feel like a pile of dry, dead bones in the wilderness. And what's God's plan? To breathe new life. To bring those bones together to give us life. Cynicism, emptiness, irrelevance. Next week, if we talk about pride or burnout or indifference or apathy, the results of all of these things, uh, the reasons we get to all of those things is brokenness. It's putting myself out there with hope and optimism and idealism, and we get singed a few times, and these things sneak up on us. So what does Scripture say? Renew your minds. You know that word renew is present tense? It's not something we did. It's constant. Renew your mind. That's change. That's Romans 12, 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new is come. And again, one more time, let me say this. That is present tense, not past. That every day we become a new creation in Christ. Luke chapter 4 says the Redeemer has come to proclaim the good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering the sight for the blind, set, the liberty, uh, set at liberty those who are oppressed, heal the brokenhearted. Jesus says, I will give you life. This is what he wants. The promise of Jesus is life, abundant life. And if I'm feeling like a valley of dry, dead bones... Guaranteed, that's not God's hope and dream for you. Do you know Jesus? We're going to celebrate Lord's Supper together. And if you know Jesus, then you're probably very familiar with what we're going to do. 
If you don't know Jesus, it's going to look rather strange, and, and the language is strange, especially in our culture. culture. But, but either way, Jesus came to earth, and as I said, to heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free, forgive and cleanse and renew, to provide the correction line for humanity, and set us up so that we can be right with God. And this cost him his life. His blood poured out and his body was broken. He was hung on a cross. That's a gruesome picture. But in doing that, he actually purchased your freedom and your life. Just before Jesus was arrested and killed, he sat down with his closest followers and explained this. His body would be broken. That in his death, he would accomplish paying the required price for our forgiveness freeing us from sin, redeemed. And, 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 and pouring out his blood would actually cleanse us and purify us and cover us so we could stand in the presence of a holy God, perfect and spotless on his account. I don't think they really got it when he explained it to them. They didn't understand it till later. But he asked them to continue doing this until when every time they met together to remember and to remind themselves what Jesus had done for them. And by asking them to eat the bread, representing his body that was going to be broken, and drink the wine, representing his blood spilled out, that they are accepting his sacrifice and saying, count me in. Count me in on the forgiveness. Count me in on the freedom from sin. Count me in on the cleansing and the purifying. Count me in on living a life in perfect communion with God and perfect communion with each other. Unity with God and peace with God and intimate with God with all the barriers removed. And at the same time, unity with each other, peace with each other, again and again removing the barriers that keep cropping up between us. And all of that in today's world is so desperately needed, desperately relevant. It might be strange in our culture. It's counterculture, but ridiculously relevant. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness and the freedom, the redeemed. Thank you for the cleansing and the purifying and covering us so that we can stand in right relationship with you because of the work of Jesus. We remember and we embrace and we return to simple truth that Jesus is our Savior. Thank you. Stir in our hearts. Let us see what we're doing and what this is about and align our lives with you. In Jesus' name.